But hurt bug thestards. But hurt bug thestards never changes. Over a year ago, a YouTuber by the name of Mr. Matty Plays posted a controversial video where he said that calling Fallout 4 a bad game is disrespectful. Mr. Matty Plays was slammed by many on YouTube for this comment. But but hurt bug thestards never changes. In the same year, a few months earlier, another YouTuber by the name of Oxhorn said that people who criticize Fallout 4 are toxic and that they should be blocked out of your life. But unlike Mr. Matty Plays, Oxhorn got away with this. Until now. These are toxic people and they just love pointing out flaws and they don't provide any positive criticism. They don't point out the positives, they're just negative people, constantly toxic. Those kind of people exist and you'll never cure those people. You can't do anything to convince those people. You must simply do what you can to block them out of your lives. I've been making videos for a very long time. And from what I've seen, you've been making videos wrong for a very long time. Such as the time when you said... Nearby, there is a desk with a terminal. On the desk is a folder with the Sunset Sarsaparilla logo on it. But what's strange about this folder is if you zoom in, the folder is labeled Brotherhood of Steel History Files. I've looked at all of the folders in this Sunset Sarsaparilla headquarters, and they all say Brotherhood of Steel History Files. I think this may be a bug. I think Obsidian is reusing assets from Fallout 3, slapped a Sunset Sarsaparilla logo on top of them, but forgot to remove the label that said Brotherhood of Steel history. That's the only way I can explain this. So that's the only way you can explain it, huh? Well, let's just go ahead and see about that, shall we? Hello, everybody. I'm standing here outside of the uh, Sunset Sarsaparilla headquarters. Now, a YouTuber by the name of Oxhorn apparently says that there's some... Uh, BOS sticker on a folder in here. Now let's see if we can't figure this out and get to the bottom of this mystery. Now here's the folder. Now he said if you zoom in you'll see a BOS sticker. Hmm. Well that's funny. I, I have a scope here and I'm zooming in. I don't see any BOS sticker. I think this uh, supposed BOS sticker is just a bunch of BS. Yep. Looks like this is nothing more than one of his mods. And yet he slanders Obsidian and says Obsidian screwed up. Well, no. No. He's the one that screwed up. And he should amend his video and apologize for slandering Obsidian by saying they put a, a BOS sticker on there when they didn't. It was his mod. The only way I can explain this is that you are a fraud and a liar. And you are not qualified to be making your so-called lore videos because they're full of lies. And this isn't even the first time, because in the very same video, you said... The third is that Obsidian simply got the lore wrong, which wouldn't be the first time. After all, remember, they placed Mr. Handy Robots, which are made by General Atomics, in the Repcon facility, which is owned by Robco, not General Atomics. The Mr. Handy Robots were a co-production between General Atomics and Robco Industries. Not one or the other, but both of them worked on and produced the Mr. Handys. Even if that was not the case, it doesn't matter because, you see, Repcon was independent of Robco at one time. It could just be as simple as um, 
the Mr. Handys were there before Robco acquired them, and they just uh, kept them after the acquisition. It, it could be as simple as that. However, the uh, the, the plaque um, says that they were co-produced um, by both, and uh, the Fallout Wiki um, confirms this. It is a cited source. Apparently, you were so butthurt about being proven wrong that back in October, you uh, tried to edit the article to change the facts to fit your bullshit lies. But I caught you red-handed. I see, I see the edit you did here. And it's also worth noting that this uh, IP address, um, I assume that's you, um, that this is the only edit that this IP has ever done on the wiki. So clearly whoever this was came here just for the sole purpose of trying to alter facts to just like Hillary Clinton when she deleted her emails. But the truth is now revealed and exposed. And yet, even this, even this, is not the full extent of your lies in this video alone. Because another thing that you lied about is when you said... Now, there are a few things that don't add up with Festus' story here. For one, the company's established date, which we see on all of the signs here in the Sunset Sarsaparilla headquarters, say 1918. This would make the Sunset Sarsaparilla company 63 years older than the Nuka-Cola company, which we know from Fallout lore was founded in 2044. We learned this date from Sierra Petrovita, whom we met in Fallout 3. This date was also reestablished established a number of times while exploring Nuka World in Fallout 4. But the problem is that Festus tells us that before Sunset Sarsaparilla was created, Nuka-Cola existed. Remember he said that all there was to drink was water and Nuka-Cola, which is impossible. Nuka-Cola did not exist in 1918. Oh really? Nuka-Cola did not exist in 1918, huh? Well, what if I told you that Nuka-Cola was in the very first Fallout game that came out in 1997 and predates Bethesda's lore by over a decade? Here is what it looks like in the uh, original game, which I doubt you have ever played, to be honest. And I think it's quite obvious to anyone with a brain that Nuka-Cola is a reference to the real-life uh, Coca-Cola which, according to Wikipedia, was founded in 1886, as you can see here. Now, I am no math wizard, like you apparently are, lol, but it seems to me that 1886 predates 1918, so if Nuka-Cola is a parody of Coca-Cola, then it seems logical that it would be that old, wouldn't it? In any case, there's no reason to trust what Bethesda has to say on the matter because Bethesda can't even get their own story straight on it, as you can see right here in this very clip. In the year 1945, my great-great-grandfather, serving in the army, wondered when he'd get to go home to his wife and the son he'd never seen. He got his wish when the U.S. ended World War II by dropping atomic bombs on Hiroshima. You know, it's one thing when the lore of a game contradicts the lore of other games, but in this case, Fallout 4 contradicts even itself. So it makes it really hard to take the game seriously when it can't even make up its own mind about various things. And this is not even the only example. Um, for example, the the ghoul in the, the fridge that doesn't need to eat or drink or breathe or sleep or whatever for 200 years. This, of course, contradicts all the lore of the previous games, which say that ghouls do have to eat or drink, etc. But... This also contradicts Fallout 4 itself because you can have ghoul settlers in your settlements which consume resources just like any other settlers do. 
If ghouls do not have to eat or drink, then why is it that these settlers consume resources? It makes no sense. Only this one example contradicts all established lore in the entire franchise. And it's things like this which make Fallout 4 impossible to, for people to take seriously because of how stupid it is and how contradictory it is. And yet, you say there are three possibilities to explain the contradiction between what Festus says and what Sierra Petrovita says. But your blatant Bethesda fanboyism prevents you from acknowledging the fact that there could be a fourth possibility, and that is that it was Bethesda who screwed up, not Obsidian. Most recently, I've started making videos for Fallout 4. Most recently, you've figured out that Fallout 4 is a lot more popular than the World of Warcraft videos that you used to make. Rawful mouth. According to Wikipedia, World of Warcraft reached its peak of 12 million subscribers back in October of 2010. More recently, Fallout 4 sold that same number of 12 million on its launch day alone. So clearly, Fallout 4 is a lot more popular than World of Warcraft. And so this is the reason why you chose to start making Fallout 4 videos because there's more money to be made from ad revenue and from Patreon donations. It is abundantly clear that all you care about is money because at the end of every video you make you panhandle your viewers for donations. I've got a t-shirt shop, folks. If you would like an Oxhorn or a Fallout-inspired shirt, you can find a link to my shop in the description below. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers gain access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. The fact of the matter is that you are a fly-by-night YouTuber, and you have no real love for the franchise. Once the popularity of Fallout 4 is gone, then you will be gone as well. You will move on to whatever happens to be popular at that moment in time. Once you've milked Fallout for all it's worth, you will kick it to the curb, just like you did with World of Warcraft. There are currently eight games in the Fallout franchise. Five, if you only count the main series. But let's be honest here, there's only three games that you really care about and make videos on, aside from a couple token videos that you made for the classic games when you were called out on it. But I'll get to that later on in the video. For now, let's just say that there's only three games that you care about, the ones from 2008 to 2015. And you're going to reach a point where you're going to do all the lore for these videos and then it'll be milk dry and what are you going to do then, huh? Unless Bethesda or somebody they hire comes out with a new game in the next year or so, you're going to have no choice but to look for another meal ticket. You say you have started making Fallout videos recently, but there have been YouTubers that have been making Fallout videos long before you came around, such as ShoddyCast, who has far more subscribers than you do because he makes far better content than you do. And then there's the Nth Apple, who was making Fallout videos before you came around, but then you came and you started making it be about money, and that kind of ruined it for him because it made him depressed. And he quit, he quit making it because of how you introduced money into the whole thing. Instead of it being a fun hobby that was done for fun, you're doing it to, for ma to make money. And that, that made him depressed. 
So he quit and he left. And you can see in his final, the final video he made on his channel, you can sense the sense of the depression that he feels because you made this fun hobby be about making money instead of doing something that he is enjoyable that he enjoyed. You are all about making money. You've all been great, and I wish you the best. And, um... And goodbye. As many of you know, in fact, many of you are watching this because you've seen my previous Fallout 4 videos, and for that, I thank you. Now, I do my best to read all of the comments that are left on my videos so that I can respond and get ideas for future videos. You guys are a great source of ideas for my future videos, so thank you for that. You do your best to read all the comments left on your videos, unless those comments are, as you say in your own words, toxic in which case you ban the person who made the comment so that they can never comment again because you are so insecure about being proven wrong that you have to silence people. When you say that you use the comments for inspiration, what you really mean is that you use the comments as a hug box to stroke your own ego. It is abundantly clear by looking at the comments on your videos that the overwhelming majority of the comments are a never-ending circle jerk of Kool-Aid drinkers. Now let's take a look at a typical comment from one of your recent videos. Now this comment here asks the question, why do you heart every comment? To which I will reply, he only hearts comments which stroke his ego. The rest of the comments you can't even see at all because they are deleted and or the commenter is banned from his channel. Now you're probably thinking that comment was posted and everything's fine, right? Well, not exactly. Let's take a look at it under another account and see what's going on here. Well, it looks like there's a reply, so let's click on that and see what happens. Hmm, I clicked on it and it says hide replies, but nothing's showing up. This is very strange. So now I'm going to go ahead and post another comment and hopefully this will work this time. Oh good, there's two replies now, so everything must be working fine then, huh? Nope, still doesn't work. It, it's as if uh, my posts are being being blocked somehow. Hmm. It appears that Mr. Oxhorn does not believe in free speech. So what exactly is going on here? Why are these posts not showing up? Well, I did a bit of research on Wikipedia, and apparently there's this thing called shadow banning where people are banned but they don't know that they're banned so their posts will not show up to other people but it will show up to them so they will think that they're posting but they're really not and for a lot of people they are probably tricked into thinking that they they're not actually banned at all it's a very sneaky and insidious form of censorship and it's pretty scary um, very Orwellian, actually. In fact, there's a controversy going on right now where Twitter has been found to be doing this very thing, of cen this very form of censorship. That's very scary stuff, to be quite honest, but that is a political matter, and that that's outside of the scope of this uh, particular video. If you're interested in researching more, then I invite you to do that. But like I said, that's outside the, the scope of this particular video, so I will not say any more on the matter. The point here was simply to establish the fact that Oxhorn will ban people that disagree with him or criticize him or criticize the game or that he 
just doesn't like for whatever reason. At this point, you're probably wondering, what exactly did I do that made Oxhorn so butthurt that he banned me? Well, it's basically like I showed earlier in the video where I wrecked him using facts and logic to destroy his bullshit. Dude, wow. Just wow. That's all he could say in response. A bunch of his Kool-Aid drinking fanatics tried to come to his defense, but the facts were against them, and because of the fact that truth and logic were on my side, some people came to my defense, and I'd like to give a shout out to these people that had the courage to speak out against this liar, even on his own his own channel, in front of all his diehard fanatical supporters. People still spoke out against him. But even though he was proven wrong with objective facts, he still, to this day, has not amended his video to change his mistakes or apologize for the lies he told to everyone. These, the video is still there, unamended, with the lies still intact. And the sad thing is a lot of people come to his channel, they watch the video, and they do no independent fact-checking of their own to, to verify that anything he says in his videos is, is actually true. They just accept it blindly at face value and uh, they leave a like so he gets thousands of likes on his videos even though the facts are wrong and it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous what he's getting away with each and every day with his videos and nobody does anything about it. I've even gone so far as to ask the YouTuber named Rags if he could make a, a video to expose this liar, like he did with Mr. Matty Plays. But I, I received no response, and it looks like nobody was ever going to do anything about it, so I, I had to take matters into my own hands, and this is why this video had to be made. No, it's up to me, because nobody else was going to do anything to, to expose this fraud for what he really is. So I had to do it, which meant that I had to learn how to edit videos, and, and that's exactly what I'm doing here. Maybe Oxhorn could ban me from his channel, but he cannot ban the truth. And this is a new year. This, this is the year 2018, and this is the year that we fight back. This is the year that we take a stand against frauds like Oxhorn. We ain't going to put up with this bullshit anymore. He's gotten away with this for too long, and, but this ends now. If we work together, and we can, we can put an end to him, and we can put an end to other frauds like him. All we have to do is follow the example set by Rags. Do what Rags did. Make, make videos exposing frauds on YouTube. Anybody can learn how to make videos. Don't wait for somebody else to make the videos for you. Take matters into your own hands, and if, if, you see a, if you see something wrong, learn how to make the videos. There's tutorials on YouTube you can watch, and just like I did. I didn't know anything, and I, I taught myself just to make this video, and you can do the same. Let this year be the year that we take a stand and we put an end to this bullshit. Over the past few months, I've detected a sentiment that I believe is running through the player base of, of Fallout 4. And that's that Fallout 4 is not as good as the previous Fallouts. This sentiment that you refer to, this toxic, I suppose you'd say, sentiment, it's been there since the game came out. And it's two years later, and the game has not improved in that time. Bethesda's development of the game has ceased. They are not updating the game. They're not fixing the game. The only updates are from modders. As of this recording, the Fallout 4 Steam page has mixed reviews of only 68% positive. Of course, uh, the most recent reviews are more favorable. However, this is just immediately after the holidays where many people are getting into the game for the very first time and they will spend hundreds or perhaps thousands of hours playing the game looking for something that they'll never find. It can be an enjoyable 
experience initially when you're exploring, but eventually you explore the entire game, and once you've done that, then you see how empty the, the game really is, how shallow, how vapid, how hollow and empty the game is. And this is the reason why it's not uncommon to find people who've played the game for hundreds of hours, but they say they hate it because they enjoyed the experience of exploring in that initial honeymoon period, but eventually that wears off and then you see the game for what it really is. Now let's take a look at another Fallout game which has stood the test of time and been around long enough for for people to have developed an informed opinion on it and gotten to know it. The game I'm talking about is Fallout New Vegas, which as you can see currently has overwhelmingly positive user reviews of 95%. Now, 95% compared to 68%. I'll I'll let you uh I'll let that sink in and you can think about that. And then maybe you'll understand exactly why you are wrong about everything. Or Fallout 4 somehow betrayed the spirit of the previous Fallout games. With all due respect, you are not qualified to say what the spirit of Fallout is when you have not even played the original Fallout games yourself. Despite what you say, you have proved multiple times throughout various videos that you have not played the original games because you are ignorant of various facts, such as in one of your more recent videos where you said... And on a table next to a lamp, we find a familiar piece of brain. For some reason, you feel a terrible sense of loss as you look at the familiar lump of gray matter. We can either take it or leave it alone. For some reason, you failed to notice that this was a reference to a previous Fallout game, which you've never played. If you had played this game, then you would know this reference, but clearly you did not. This is a reference to the mutated toe from Fallout 2, which in the description says, you see your sixth toe. It is a small mutated part of yourself. For some reason, you feel a terrible sense of loss as you look at the tiny amputated toe. Now, Bethesda put this in the game as a reference to Fallout 2, which at that time was the last game prior to Fallout 3, expecting that people that played the game would understand this reference. But today, 90% or more of players have not played the original games and do not, they're completely oblivious to this, these references. And you are no exception, Mr. Oxhorn. You have not played these games. You do not get the references. You, they go right over your head. You are oblivious to them. And this is one, this is another example of many of why you are not qualified to be making your so-called lore videos. They're not lore videos at all. What you're doing is you're recording gameplay footage of heavily modded games with commentary. That's what you're doing. You're not giving lore. You're just you're recording gameplay footage of games that you heavily modded and altered with mods to the point where you're changing the facts of the game and then you report these as facts, but it's not. Which I'm referring to that BOS sticker at the Sunset Sarsaparilla headquarters, of course, because that was from a mod. But I'm sure this is something that's happened in your videos numerous times other than that one instance. And and you're reporting this these as facts, but they're not. You're just recording gameplay footage and talking about it. You're not giving actual lore. You're not doing research. You're not checking your facts. You're just you're just recording footage of yourself playing the game. And that's not lore. That's not lore videos. Shoddycast and the Nth Apple were the real Fallout lore makers, but you are just a fraud and your channel is just a hug box for casuals who are there just for settlement building tips. That's it. You're not, you're a fraud. Anyway, that's that. 
Now, let's move on to the next piece of evidence, shall we? This comes from your retcons video, where you defend Bethesda's retcons, just like in this video where you defend Fallout 4. The big retcon that I think is unnecessary and that I don't understand is the one about Jet. We know where Jet comes from. Jet plays an important role in Fallout 2. In Fallout 2, we meet the inventor of Jet, a young boy genius named Mirnon. What makes this even more frustrating is we know the lengths that Mirnon went to to invent Jet. This right here is a definite smoking gun which proves beyond all doubt that you have never played the original Fallout games. You obviously looked on a website perhaps the Fallout wiki, and saw the text that said Myron, M-Y-R-O-N, and you pronounced it Mirnon, which that isn't even how it's spelled, so I don't even know how you made that mistake. But had you played the game, you would, you would know how Myron's name is pronounced because he tells you in his own words. Okay, okay, I'll wait here. Whew. You could show me a little more respect, you know. I am Myron. A wise man once said, It is better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to speak and to remove all doubt. Your problem, Mr. Oxhorn, is that you chose to speak and you've removed all doubt that you are a fool. You speak with authority on matters that you know absolutely nothing whatsoever about, you would be doing yourself a favor if you would stop making what you call lore videos because you're just embarrassing yourself. Now some people might be quick to point out that Oxhorn made a couple token original Fallout videos, and that is true, he did. He made token ones. After he was called out on it by yours truly. Now look at the time when he when these videos were uploaded. It said these were f uploaded five months ago, and I called him out five months ago, and these videos were uploaded a few days after that. Now isn't that a strange coincidence? Now what are the odds that somebody would say, "Hey, you don't make original Fallout videos," and then a few days later a couple appear? But why wasn't there any before this? And why hasn't there been any since then? That is the question. Doing something just for the sake of saying that you did something is an example of doing something in bad faith. Bad faith is a form of fraud or deception. Now I have proven in this video a few examples where Oxhorn has lied and been caught red-handed lying. So what else could you expect of a man of such low moral character? And yet he frequently tries to preach morality in his videos, but he is a very immoral man himself, as it turns out, because lies and fraud are immoral. And he can ban people for saying that, but he cannot ban the truth or that Bethesda is just in it for the money and... The exact same thing can be said about you, Mr. Oxhorn. The way you panhandle your viewers at the end of every video, try to sell them t-shirts, etc. Anyway, yes, Bethesda is in it only for money. They are a business, of course, and like all businesses, they are motivated by profit. However, in Bethesda's case, it goes beyond this. It's one thing to make an honest profit and another to fleece your customers and take advantage of them and jack up the price for no good reason and water down the content with bullshit garbage that should be given for free, if anything. The fact that Fallout 4 has a season pass at all when every previous game did not have a season pass speaks for itself about how greedy Bethesda is and has become these last couple years.
A lot of people think that Bethesda used to be these saints that could do no wrong and that recently they they've changed all of a sudden but in reality they've always been this way they've always been greedy back in 2006 they had horse armor dlc for their game oblivion which is just a skin of armor for your horse now if you've ever played the elder scrolls games you know that the horses are disposable and useless other than to ride around and even then you don't even really need them because you can fast travel once you've discovered a place but regardless Bethesda thought they could charge people for this and get away with it and they received a lot of criticism at the time over it but this goes to show that they've always been this way so this is nothing new now the creation club is even worse than that but you can see the roots of the creation club in the horse armor dlc from over 10 years ago which goes to show that if bethesda could have done a creation club or something like it back then they undoubtedly would have the only reason they didn't back then wasn't because they were saints back at the time but because there were technical limitations of the consoles which made it impossible to run mods or anything of that sort but now consoles those console limitations are gone and it's technically possible for consoles to have mods so now those technical limitations are gone and Bethesda is taking advantage of that anyway I will get into the creation club in more detail later on but for now let's focus on this season pass for Fallout 4 and how it was a disappointment and how it was just a cash grab. To understand why Fallout 4's add-ons were so disappointing, we must first look at the add-ons of the previous Fallout games, Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas. These add-ons are something that you should know quite well because you've played them and covered them in your let's play videos oops I mean I mean your lore videos oh my bad sorry about that how silly of me Fallout 3 had five add-ons and each of these add-ons were story add-ons which added new quests new content that was actually befitting of a Fallout game and not some mere garbage settlement building bullshit for casuals these may not be the greatest dlcs of all time but at least they've added to something to the game you have operation anchorage the pit broken steel point lookout and mothership zeta and each and every one of these was priced at nine dollars and 99 cents now i know that inflation is a thing and since Fallout 3 came out, a few years have passed, but to go from $9.99 a DLC to $25 for Far Harbor is insane. Inflation cannot be an excuse to justify this colossal cash grab by Bethesda, this fleecing of their fans. In the case of Fallout New Vegas, there were six DLCs, however only four of them were story quest DLCs and Gunrunner's Arsenal and the Courier's Stash do not add story or quest to the game however they do add functional and useful items to the game and not some garbage that you use in, to build settlements with each of the four story add-ons for Fallout New Vegas were priced at $9.99 just like the Fallout 3 add-ons. Gunrunner's Arsenal, however, was priced at $4 and Courier's Stash was priced at $2. Now these, like I said, are not story DLCs, but they do add functional and useful items to the game that you can use to go on your adventures, as opposed to some garbage that you use to decorate like little Susie Homemaker in your settlements. 
which is never what Fallout was supposed to be. Fallout is supposed to be a post-apocalyptic wasteland adventure. It's not supposed to be where you play a homemaker and build a settlement. Now let's take a look at the Fallout 4 add-ons that are included with the Season Pass. You have Automatron, which does have a tiny bit of story in it, but it's extremely short, and it's mostly about building a robot. So I would argue it's more like a workshop DLC than a story DLC. But this was priced at $9.99, just like the each of the Fallout 3 and New Vegas DLCs, which have far more content. Would, would you say that Automatron at $10 is worth an equal amount to, say, Point Lookout or Old World Blues or the pit or honest hearts or whatever would you say that it's worth the same amount i wouldn't i don't think that most people would say that it's worth 9.99 yet this is what bethesda priced it at then you have the three garbage workshop dlcs which do nothing except add assets into the game to build and decorate your settlements with but if you don't build settlements, then the DLC is useless. And these are $5 each times 3. That's $15 worth of content right there that is garbage. Now, Bethesda says that's worth $15. Now, maybe you think so. Maybe a lot of your subscribers think so. But for the majority of the Fallout uh, fan base, it's garbage. Then you have... Nuka World and Far Harbor priced at $20 and $25 respectively. Now I'm not saying these are bad DLCs. In fact, they're even better than the vanilla game to be honest. But are they worth $25 and $20 each when the Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas DLCs were half or a third as much? Now, like I said, inflation is a thing, but it's not like these games came out like 50 years ago. So how can you justify doubling or tripling of the price when only five years have passed? If the prices were increased to like twelve ninety nine instead of nine ninety nine, I I could accept that, but not twenty five dollars. That is just insane. That's ridiculous. This, is, this proves that Bethesda is fleecing their customers and being greedy just because they can get away with it. And the reason they are able to get away with it is because of shill fanboy supporters like you who say that it's unfair or disrespectful or that people who complain about this are toxic. Instead of blaming Bethesda for their being greedy, you blame the victims. You seem to think that Consumers should just take this up the ass and accept it, but I don't think so, and that's why I will speak out against this. The fact that Fallout 4 has a season pass at all is a bad thing in and of itself, because season passes are inherently anti-consumer, because you are essentially writing a blank check without even knowing what you are getting, or going to get, I should say, and you hope that the developer will come through and deliver on what you paid them. But there's no guarantee that they will. They they can do whatever they want. They can they could just release filler garbage settlement crap to pad it out and that's what you get. And you can't do anything about it because they set the prices. They they can tell you that this is worth this amount, but it might not be worth that much to you. They define the prices. They say it's fifty dollars worth of content, but but is it really worth fifty dollars? Of course, the season pass was thirty dollars originally, but Bethesda came to the conclusion that they could jack the price up to fifty dollars and get away with it. See, what probably happened was they intended to to release the settlement DLCs for free as a free download. But then at some meeting, they decided 
They can include this in the season pass and charge money for it instead of giving it away for free. So $30 season pass became a $50 season pass because they said they, they're increasing the amount of content, but in reality, what they're giving is not something that a lot of people would have even paid for had they known what it would end up being. They took advantage of their customers. The people who bought the season pass were expecting that they would receive content similar and on par with what they received from Fallout 3 and New Vegas. They were expecting that the DLC would be like that. They weren't expecting that it would that it would be nothing more than casual Bob the Builder filler Minecraft garbage. And yet that is exactly what it turned out to be. And that is why there is so much disappointment and hatred towards this game and towards Bethesda for what how they treated their community. Bethesda added even further insult to injury in their official press release where they announced that they were jacking up the price when they said that, quote, this is our way of saying thanks to all our loyal fans who have believed in us and supported us over the years. This is the equivalent of raping someone in the ass and then having the gall to say that this was doing them some kind of favor. And they don't really care about the lore. They don't. And just like you, they aren't really interested in discussing why either. Pete Hines was probably thinking Jarrett Johnston is a toxic individual and that he should block him out of his life. So Pete Hines said, I'm not interested in discussing this with you and just like you when you ban people. You are a lot like Pete Hines in the sense that you are good at telling people what you think they want to hear as opposed to telling them the truth. So you would make a great marketing director for Bethesda. If Pete Hines were ever to retire, you would be a good replacement because you're good at lying and that's what the job is all about. Todd Howard's job is to tell people that it just works, but Pete Hines' job is to tell people that it just is. And people are expected to just accept that, regardless of facts. They don't care about their gamers. They're... Correct me if I'm wrong here, but isn't Jarrett Johnston one of Bethesda's gamers? I mean, he was one of their gamers. Hard to say if he still is after the way Pete Hines treated him. I think it's safe to say that over the last few years, Bethesda has lost a lot of their customers. One example that I know of would be Mr. Caption, who made an excellent Fallout 4 review video titled No Todds, No Masters. I strongly recommend everybody go check that video out. Trust me, it is without a doubt the best and most in-depth and comprehensive Fallout 4 video that you will ever see. I highly recommend it. It may be a bit of a spoiler, but... Near the end of his video, he says, I am unsure if I am going to even consider buying the next game in the series. And to Bethesda, even though I know there is no chance anyone from that place is listening. Unless something about the way you guys conduct yourselves and how you make your games changes, you have lost a customer. You have probably lost many customers. I agree with him that Bethesda probably has lost many customers. And this isn't even factoring in the bad will Bethesda garnered for themselves through the Creation Club, which didn't even exist at the time that Mr. Caption made that video, and did not exist at the time when you made your Defense of Fallout 4 video. Now, I would like to believe that if the Creation Club had existed back at the time when you made your video that you would not be such a Bethesda apologist shill fanboy like you are. Sadly, you are beyond hope because even this is not beneath you. Even the Creation Club, as terrible as it is, is something that you will defend. 
Bethesda released a new update to the Creation Club yesterday. It's been quite a while. I, for one, have been looking forward to this update. So let's dig on in and see what we've got today. Yeah, I wasn't kidding. And this is a low that even Mr. Matty plays at his worst. For Despite all the criticism that he received, he, he was never as bad as this. Unlike you, Mr. Matty plays has actually criticized the creation club so it makes no sense to me why he receives so much hate and yet you who are far worse are completely off the hook and and you are given a free pass and it makes no sense whatsoever anyway at this point bethesda has kicked the game to the curb and the only updates from here on out are creation club updates once Bethesda finished with Nuka World, that was it. They washed their hands of the game, and that's it. They're done. Now, in contrast to that, let's look at the recent updates of a different game, which was made by a real developer who treats their gamers right, unlike Bethesda. As of this recording... These are the most recent updates to Pillars of Eternity, which was made by Obsidian. Now, there is no Creation Club here, or anything equivalent to that. Instead, these updates give free content, and no Season Pass is required. So no, Bethesda does not care about their gamers, especially when you compare them to developers that do care about their gamers and you see the difference fleecing gamers with season passes and paid mods proves that bethesda does not care about them at all they're just a bunch of muddy grubbing capitalists those evil game makers you said it not me and so on and so forth care to elaborate on that and as a fellow geek as somebody who loves games and as somebody who loves role-playing... As someone who loves role-playing, how about you actually play some real role-playing games? Such as the ones as you can see in this picture here. Now, as you can see, Fallout 4 is not among these games, nor does it deserve to be. Fallout 4 is a casual Minecraft settlement building game with guns. And that's all it is. There is no role playing to be had or to be found. Now, among these games, there is Fallout New Vegas, and that is the only RPG that you actually play. And even then, you get the lore so wrong on it that I think you completely miss the point. As a self proclaimed fan of role playing, these are the games that you should be playing because life is too short to waste on saving settlements and building settlements and infinite vapid repeating radiant quests Todd Howard says that his games have quote infinite quests but this is only true when you consider that these are repeating radiant quests and the reason why they are repeating is because they are so simplistic and dumbed down to the point that they are simply go here and kill this or go and retrieve a MacGuffin. There is no writing or story. You are simply performing the rote tasks of an automaton. There is no thinking to be done or decisions to be made. A true RPG gives players freedom to make decisions that have an impact on the world and the freedom to build their character the way they choose. Fallout 4 does not give players the freedom to build their character the way they choose. You can either be Nate or you can be Nora. You cannot be anyone else other than an army veteran who sounds like Brian T. Delaney or a law school graduate who sounds like Courtney Taylor. You can customize your character's name, 
That is, of course, provided that the name that you wish to choose is among those that Bethesda allows you to choose. If it isn't, then you're screwed. And you can also customize your character's appearance. But, aside from your character's name and appearance, you have zero control over it whatsoever. You can create a reskinned and renamed variant of either Nate or Nora, but you are still either Nate or Nora, just changing the name and the appearance. The character is already written for you and defined. You also could not be a male law school graduate or a female veteran if you chose to do so. Likewise, once you've built your reskin of Nate or Nora, you then have no freedom whatsoever to have any impact on the world. Right from the very start of the game, you are given no freedom to tell the vault tech rep to go fuck himself. If you try, your spouse will override you and will force it to happen anyway. This is forced to happen whether you want it to or not. And this happens throughout the entire game, such as, for example, when you meet Kellogg, you are given four dialogue options, but all four of them are ways to initiate hostility with Kellogg. There is zero option to try to resolve things peacefully, to not kill Kellogg. You are given no option to be a pacifist. Fallout 4 forces you in the direction prescribed by Todd Howard and Emil Pagliarulo. Likewise, just as you cannot be a pacifist in Fallout 4, you cannot be a mass murderer and kill everybody in the game because many characters are essential and unkillable. So on one hand, you cannot not kill Kellogg, but on the other hand, you cannot kill Preston Garvey or Dogmeat or many other characters throughout the game. Fallout 4 fails as an RPG because it fails to allow players to be and to create their own characters. In character building... And well, you aren't going to find that in Fallout 4, that's for sure. As I said, you can either be Nate or you can be Nora. The fact that you can rename and reskin your Nate or Nora variant does not change that fact. The original Fallouts, as well as Fallout New Vegas, had these optional characteristics called traits, which allowed players to give more nuance to their characters and alter how the game was played. Unlike perks, traits had both positive and negative characteristics. So you could create a character that excelled in a certain respect, but this came at the cost of an additional negative effect. Now, Todd Howard is apparently scared of players having this negative effect, so he stripped the traits out of the game in Fallout 3. However, when Obsidian made New Vegas, they restored the traits back to the game. But when Bethesda made Fallout 4, they took the traits back out again. Now, why do you suppose they did this? I think a clue can be found in the 2012 DICE keynote delivered by Todd Howard. My favorite sort of ego-stroking design to make you feel great moment in any game is Peggle. Have you, everybody here played Peggle? Have you finished a level? If you haven't, all levels end this way. I'm pretty great. I think I'll play another level. I think this sheds a bit of light on Todd Howard's design philosophy for his games. Ego stroking. This is how his mind works. In Fallout 3 and 4, as well as Skyrim, the world and all the characters in it are designed to revolve around the player character. Instead of the player role-playing a character in the world, 
the player is role-playing a demigod that is nigh on invincible and overpowered as fuck. The entire world revolves around the player character and every character in the game kisses the player character's ass. For example, in Skyrim, there is a town the player character comes across fairly early on and this town is being attacked by a dragon. And once the player saves the town from the dragon, everyone in the town treats the player character like they're some kind of god and gives them this mansion and they are even assigned a servant named Lydia. And this is the case in every town in the game. Also, in addition to that, there are these guilds which the player can join and work their way up to becoming the leader of. And it's all too easy to become the leader of every guild in the game simultaneously. You see, it is exactly like Todd Howard said in his 2012 dice keynote speech his design philosophy is all about ego stroking the player and making the player feel like they're a god as opposed to a character in a world now i have not played peggle or even heard of it until watching that video but from what i've seen it looks an awful lot like the leveling up screen in skyrim so you see, that is where the inspiration must have came from. The exact same design philosophy of ego stroking the player is very clearly at work in Fallout 4. For example, just take a look at the infantile perk poster Bethesda made for Fallout 4. Aesthetically, this looks like something that would be more appropriate for preschool as opposed to a a supposedly M-rated mature game for grown-ups. And as I said, the traits are gone from the game because traits have negative characteristics and these negative characteristics contradict Bethesda's design philosophy of ego stroking the player. And we can't have that now, can we? The other thing to say here is that Bethesda merged the perks and skills and the special attributes together all into one infantile kindergarten poster. And this is yet another example of Bethesda's toddlerization of a beloved RPG franchise. Now, I'm sure you don't see the problem here, but you are not nor were you ever a fan of the original fallouts come to think of it todd howard probably feels the same way about traits that you feel about people who criticize fallout 4 just like how you say that people who criticize fallout 4 are toxic todd howard probably thinks that traits are toxic for having negative effects because these negative effects do not support his design philosophy of sucking the player off and stroking their ego. Settlement building. Settlement building is not what Fallout is supposed to be about. As I said, Fallout is supposed to be a post-apocalyptic wasteland adventure, not a Bob the Builder Minecraft game. You may as well just Go ahead and play Minecraft if that is what you'd prefer. There's no shame in it. I have nothing against base building games in principle, but I'm just saying that this is not what Fallout is supposed to be. Besides, there are far better dedicated base building games out there, such as RimWorld, which, as you can see here, has a positive user score of 97% on Steam compared to a mere 68% for Fallout 4. Incidentally, I came across this image on Reddit where someone created the town of Good Springs in Rimworld. 
Now, I just thought I'd share that. And if the extraterrestrial setting of RimWorld doesn't appeal to you, here is an example of a post-apocalyptic base building game on Steam with 86% positive reviews. And, of course, there is Minecraft, which has sold over 121 million copies, according to Wikipedia. This is billions of dollars here. And you can be sure that Bethesda took note of this. Minecraft came out exactly one week after Skyrim. So Skyrim wasn't built from the ground up to try to capitalize on this gimmick, this fad. Although Bethesda did come out with the Hearthfire add-on, which is obviously a precursor to the settlement mode that we see in Fallout 4. Like I said, Minecraft's success came too late for Skyrim to be built around something similar to that. But you can be sure that Bethesda took note of how popular and profitable Minecraft was, and as soon as they finished with developing Skyrim, they initiated development on Fallout 4. Incidentally, Bethesda filed a lawsuit against the creator of Minecraft because of a game called Scrolls, and Bethesda, for some reason, thought they owned the rights to the word scrolls. This isn't the only example of Bethesda bullying a smaller developer. In 2015, Bethesda filed a lawsuit against an indie developer over a game called Fortress Fallout. Now, Bethesda owns the rights to the trademark, and they have the right to defend it. However, they are hypocrites because while they are all in favor of protecting their own intellectual property, they have no problem trampling over the intellectual property of others. For example, they named one of their Fallout 4 Workshop DLCs Wasteland Workshop, and Bethesda must have known full well that there is a game called Wasteland and its sequel, Wasteland 2, which is made and owned by In Exile. And as you can see here, Brian Fargo was none too happy about that, but In Exile doesn't have the financial resources to take Bethesda to court to defend their trademark. And Bethesda had to have known this, but decided to name the DLC that anyway, just to be assholes and rub it in, knowing that Brian Fargo wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Anyway, that's kind of getting off topic of the subject of settlements. Aside from the fact that settlements have no place in a Fallout game, there's also the matter of how they were poorly implemented in Fallout 4. As Mr. Caption said in his No Todds, No Masters Fallout 4 review video, Well, the weird thing is, because you built defenses to defend yourself from raider attacks, raider attacks stop happening, because your defense value is put into the green. It's an incredibly weird gameplay mechanic when you really think about it, you build defenses to defend yourself from raiders, but because you build defenses, you never have to defend yourself from raiders because they never attack. Oh, and I'm very sure someone's gonna try and pull the whole, oh, but it's more realistic, because raiders would attack a big fort thing, but this isn't really a matter of realism, it's a matter of game design. Like, imagine if food worked the same way. Settlers needed to eat, so you plant crops, but because you planted crops, no one ever goes to eat them. The defenses, as is their nature in their name, are supposed to be there to DEFEND against attacks, not to outright erase them. What's the point of the defenses existing if I never get to use them? It's kind of... boring. 
Yeah. And everything associated with science fiction and fantasy and video games and first-person shooters and the rest. Ah, yes. First-person shooters. Now, if there is one thing which Fallout 4 has improved over its predecessors, that would be the shooting mechanics. But that isn't saying much, considering how terrible the shooting was in the previous games, especially in Fallout 3, which had non-existent sights on the guns, and the clunky Gamebryo engine, quite frankly, wasn't the greatest when it came to gunplay. Of course, there are mods for Fallout 3 which do add in iron sights, but Bethesda doesn't deserve to be credited for the work that was done by the community. Similarly, when it comes to Fallout 4, Bethesda had to ask id Software for help. So yes, the shooting mechanics in Fallout 4 are a lot better than Fallout 3, but Bethesda doesn't deserve the credit for this. The credit belongs to id Software. I think that these kinds of attitudes are not only unfair to the people who create the games that we play. I think that you're shilling for a multi-billion dollar company is unfair to consumers. Bethesda is not a charity. They do not make games out of the kindness of their hearts. They're making games to make money, just like you make videos to make money. There is nothing inherently wrong about making money. However, there is also nothing inherently wrong about criticizing a game or criticizing the people that made it. Saying that it is unfair to criticize Bethesda or saying that people who criticize Bethesda are toxic is no different than saying that calling Fallout 4 a bad game is disrespectful. If anyone is unfair or toxic or disrespectful, it is you and people like you who are toxic and disrespectful to the community and to the fans. This bullshit video you made deserves to have 10,000 times more dislikes than what it has. The fact that so many people gave this a like is fucking ridiculous. How the fuck do you get away with saying that criticizing Fallout 4 is unfair, but when Mr. Matty Plays says... But this is one instance where I'm going to stand there and be like, if you didn't like Fallout 4, that's great. If you like Fallout 4, that's great. But to call it a bad game is honestly disrespectful. People come down on him like a hammer. What? To call it a bad game is honestly disrespectful. No, I... I must have misheard you. To call it a bad game is honestly disrespectful. To call it a bad game is honestly disrespectful. To call it a bad game is honestly disrespectful. Are you fucking shitting me? Calling Fallout 4 is disrespectful. To who, Bethesda? Or to you? Are they being- Now later on in the video, he says something that is just ridiculous. He says, if you say Fallout 4 is a bad game, it's disrespectful. You can say it's a disappointing game, but if you say it's a bad game, it's disrespectful. Are you fucking serious, Matty? It's called having a different opinion, and don't talk about games like Ride to Hell Retribution to justify that. You can't say Fallout 4 is a bad game. I said it's a mediocre game, and it really is a bad Fallout game. Some people think it's the worst in the franchise. Some people legitimately think it's a bad game. I'm in that camp. I think it's a mediocre game overall, leaning towards bad, but it's definitely a bad Fallout game. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's called having a different opinion. An instance where I'm gonna stand there and be like, if you didn't like Fallout 4, that's great. If you like Fallout 4, that's great. But to call it a bad game is honestly disrespectful. In a weird way, I had to sort of just free myself up to believe that it was okay to be stupid or dumb. To be a moron. Yeah. To be moronical. Exactly. To be a moron. An imbecile. Yeah. Like the dumbest motherfucker that ever lived. You went full retard, man. Never go full retard. These examples pretty much summarize the community's reaction to Mr. Matty Play's assertion that 
Calling Fallout 4 a bad game is disrespectful. And what was the community reaction to Oxhorn saying that criticizing Fallout 4 is unfair or toxic? And that's why it's up to me to make this video, because apparently nobody else had the moral courage to speak out against this fanboy shill who sides with Bethesda against the community, who says that it is unfair to criticize Bethesda, and if you do, you are toxic. There's no difference between what Oxhorn said and what Mr. Matty Play said. Except that Mr. Matty Plays was called out for what he said. And because he was called out, he has learned his lesson and he is now a better person. But Oxhorn was never called out and he never learned any lesson. Odds are nobody's ever going to see this video because I'm not a very successful YouTuber or a very popular channel. But I have to do what I can, you know. I have to try. Because apparently nobody else is going to say anything. But they rob us of the joy that we should be getting from playing these games. Once again, you blame the victims. As if it's the fault of consumers that Bethesda made a shitty game. Also, I'm not sure that joy is the correct word to describe the emotions that one should feel when playing a gritty post-apocalyptic wasteland adventure in a world filled with devastation and sorrow. Like any good RPG, Fallout should invoke in players the full gamut of human emotions. Not only joy, but all emotions that one might feel, including negative emotions such as sorrow, sadness, loss, anger, rage, etc. Tim Kaine, the creator of the Fallout franchise, once said, My idea is to explore more of the world and more of the ethics of a post-nuclear world, not to make a better plasma gun. Now, in contrast to that, Todd Howard who created Fallout 3 and Fallout 4, said, Violence is funny. Let's all just own up to it. Violence done well is fucking hilarious. It's like itchy and scratchy, or jackass. Now that's funny. Now, the lowest common denominator of gamers might agree with that, but the lowest common denominator of gamers are people that do not play the original Fallouts such as yourself. That being said, I'm sure that you don't even know who this man, Tim Kaine, even is. Um, have a sad undertone to the thing. Again, marketing wasn't sure. They came to me a few times and said, are you sure you want this music? Because it's kind of depressing. And I said, have you played the game? It's, everybody's dead in the world, you know, it should be depressing. Here, Tim Kaine talks about the dark, ambient soundtrack that he selected for Fallout. The soundtrack for the original Fallout was put together by a composer named Mark Morgan. And as Tim Kaine says, the soundtrack is designed to have a sad undertone which matches the desolate setting of Fallout. Everybody is dead, so it should be depressing. That is kind of the point of the game. The game isn't meant to be some Ronald McDonald Funland where you fly around in jetpacks and build settlements and other stupid crap like that. Now, in contrast to what Tim Kaine just said, let's turn back to what Todd Howard said in his 2012 DICE keynote. My favorite sort of ego-stroking design to make you feel great moment in any game is Peggle. Have you, everybody here played Peggle? Have you finished a level? If you haven't, all levels end this way. Mm -hmm. 
I'm pretty great. I think I'll play another level. It is worth noting that that song that plays in Peggle at the clearing of each level is a song called Ode to Joy by Ludwig van Beethoven. This is in sharp contrast to the dark ambient soundtrack of the original Fallout games as composed by Mark Morgan under the direction of Tim Kaine. I find it interesting how you speak of joy as if it is the only emotion that one should feel when playing a video game. And clearly Todd Howard feels the same. He cites the game Peggle and the ego stroking that is found therein. The name of the song is Ode to Joy, not Ode to Sorrow, not Ode to Anger, not Ode to Disgust, not Ode to Sadness, but Joy, and only Joy. Again, this is in keeping with Todd Howard's design philosophy of sucking off the player and stroking the player's ego. Now, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't criticize games or that those who criticize Fallout 4 are inherently bad or doing something wrong. I don't believe that at all. Clearly, you do believe that, despite what you say, because that was the entire point why you made this video, because you are so butthurt by people criticizing Fallout 4 that you felt the need to defend it in a 20 plus minute long video. You cannot say that people who criticize Fallout 4 are being unfair to Bethesda or toxic or disrespectful on one hand, and then in the other hand say that people should criticize games. Clearly you do not believe that people should criticize games. Unless you mean that people can only criticize games that you are not a fanboy of or that you do not use as a meal ticket. That said, you probably are okay with people criticizing 99.9999999% of games that exist, but when they criticize Fallout 4, then it becomes a problem to you because they are criticizing what you are making money off of. Then you take it personally and say that they are toxic, that it is unfair, that they should be blocked, etc. One does not make a 20 plus minute video defending a game from criticism if they are okay with said criticism. You say that you are okay with criticism, but your actions say the exact opposite. This is another example of duplicity and bad faith on your part. Mr. Matty Plays was guilty of the exact same sort of duplicity in his Why Do Some Gamers Love Hating Fallout 4 video when he said This is not a video designed to help defend Fallout 4. And again, further on in the video, he reiterates this. I hope at this point in my channel's life, you know that I'm not making this video just to defend Fallout 4. I he said this immediately before his infamous calling Fallout 4 a bad game is disrespectful moment. So despite what he said, everyone could see that this was that it was very clearly a defense of Fallout 4 video. And that is also exactly what your video is. You are defending Fallout 4. You even titled it In Defense of Fallout 4. The bottom line here is simply this. You say that people should criticize games, but you don't genuinely and honestly believe that. At least not in the case of Fallout 4 anyway. You place Fallout 4 on a pedestal and think that it is above all criticism. You should criticize games just like all art should be criticized. All art should be criticized but people who criticize Fallout 4 are unfair, toxic, disrespectful, etc. Is this implying that Fallout 4 is not art? If this is what you are implying, then this would explain your contradictions. And I agree, Fallout 4 is not art, but rather a commodity. 
Bethesda sought to imitate and duplicate the success of Minecraft, which sold 121 million copies, and this is where the settlement mode came from. This was not an original idea by Bethesda, nor is the idea for a voice protagonist. That is something that has been done in many games for decades. It's a terrible idea for an RPG, but it has been done before in other genres. So that was no innovation by Bethesda either. It was simply a case of monkey see, monkey do. Todd Howard looked at what other games in the industry are doing and simply imitated that. And Todd Howard's henchman, Emil Pagliarulo, is a terrible writer with no creativity or imagination. Emil Pagliarulo's philosophy is keep it simple and keep it stupid. So what's the story with Bethesda's stories? How do we make our stories and how do I personally make my stories? Um, I thought, you know, it's funny, I, I had never really thought of the process that I use to write stories and make games, and then I realized I do have a process. Um, and I started to put it together, I realized that there are three primary points that I use when I create a story for one of our games. So I thought I'd run through those three points um, for everyone here today. Um, the first is, kiss. Keep it simple, stupid. This is my own personal rule for myself, right? And I'll go through each of these individually. Um, keep it simple and keep it stupid is a good way to describe Bethesda's terrible writing and simplistic quest design. Go and kill this and or bring back a MacGuffin. Rinse and repeat. That is Bethesda's quest design in a nutshell. So keep it simple and keep it stupid certainly is a good way of describing it. Another way to put it is unnuanced and vapid. Since you mentioned the word art, how about we take a look at a few examples of some real art, such as the novel Moby Dick, written by Herman Melville. Moby Dick is widely considered to be one of the greatest works of literature of all time. But what most people do not know is that Moby Dick was a commercial failure during the time of Herman Melville's life. So despite how critically acclaimed it is today, Moby Dick was poorly received and very little known during the life of the author. Now, you like to talk about what is unfair, etc. So please explain to me what exactly is fair about how Herman Melville wrote one of the greatest novels of all time, yet saw no success from it during his lifetime. Where, what is fair about that? Perhaps if Herman Melville included a settlement mode or some vapid bullshit Ronald McDonald Funland in the book, then perhaps it would have sold well during his lifetime. But, had he done that, the book would have been shit. Just like Fallout 4 is shit. Commercial success is not a good measure of a work's critical or artistic value, which cannot be measured by money. Many Fallout 4 apologists, perhaps including yourself, would be quick to point out that Fallout 4 has sold millions and millions and millions of copies, and you would say that this makes the game a great game. But McDonald's Happy Meals sell hundreds, if not billions, but does that mean that McDonald's Happy Meals are better than some gourmet meal at a fancy restaurant, simply because they sell more? So put that in your cigar and smoke it. Herman Melville's Moby Dick is not the only example of a work of art that was poorly received during the time of the author's life. Another example would be the entire works of the artist Vincent Van Gogh. Vincent Van Gogh was unsuccessful during his lifetime, and he died in total poverty. 
In fact, he was so unsuccessful that he took his own life because he believed that his life had no value. And yet, today, he is considered one of the greatest artists that ever lived. And this is often the case in video games as well, where the best and the greatest and most artistic and creative video games are often extremely unsuccessful and the companies that make them end up going bankrupt. So you want to talk about what's unfair, how about we talk about these game developers that the majority of gamers never even heard of, and yet they are the ones that created the franchises that we know and love. Now, earlier you spoke of joy, and I think it's worth noting that when you look at the works of Vincent van Gogh, the word joy is not what you would use to describe these paintings. These paintings depict the lives of real people going about their daily lives and feeling the whole gamut of human emotions. Now, when you look at these paintings, you see the deep emotional pain, not only of the people that are in the paintings, but also of the painter himself. I suppose one might say that joy is a very shallow emotion and perhaps the most fleeting. According to Vincent's brother Theo, his final words were, quote, the sadness will last forever. Now, if both Bethesda and Obsidian were to have made a game about the life of Vincent van Gogh, how do you suppose their approaches to that game's development would have differed? Once again, let us look at what Tim Kaine and Todd Howard have said in their own words that reflects on their respective philosophies of game design. Tim Kaine said, quote, My idea is to explore more of the world and more of the ethics of a post-nuclear world not to make a better plasma gun. Now Todd Howard says, quote, Violence is funny. Let's all just own up to it. Violence done well is fucking hilarious. It's like itchy and scratchy or jackass. Now that's funny. I think that, based on these respective quotes, Tim Kaine would have focused more on the man behind the paintings and the sadness that was reflected in the paintings and felt by the painter himself that ultimately led him to taking his own life. Todd Howard, on the other hand, would have been more focused on the gun that Vincent van Gogh used to take his own life. And since suicide is a form of violence, and according to Todd Howard, violence is, quote, funny... I suspect that Todd Howard would have found humor in this, or as you put it, joy. To your way of thinking, Tim Kaine's approach by focusing on the sadness is negative, and I suppose you would say that Tim Kaine is toxic and robbing himself of the joy that he should feel in this man's emotional agony and the fact that he took his own life. You think that he should find the joy in that. Anyway, perhaps Vincent van Gogh should have made his paintings be about jetpacks and settlement building and ghouls trapped inside of refrigerators and creation clubs, etc. Perhaps if Vincent van Gogh hadn't robbed himself of the joy by being so toxic, then perhaps he would have been more financially successful in life, and he would have been happier because money is the only thing that really matters, right? All art should be criticized, but Bethesda does not know what art is, and quite honestly, neither do you. What I'm talking about goes beyond constructive criticism and into just unthinking toxicity. Unthinking toxicity, huh? You know, 
this sounds eerily similar to something I've heard in another video that was made by another YouTuber. Just abruptly bashing it in an unintelligent way. Unthinking toxicity, abruptly bashing in an unintelligent way, tomato, tomato, it's all basically the same thing. There is, however, one difference, one key difference between what you said and what Mr. Maddie Plays said. And that key difference is that you got away with it. When Mr. Maddie Plays dismissed criticism of Fallout 4 as abruptly bashing it in an unintelligent way, the YouTube response was just abruptly bashing it in an unintelligent way. Yeah, this is the kind of shit that makes me think that you are using this video to defend Fallout 4 from criticism in this weird, blanket sort of way. If I play a shooter game and there's a weapon that's overpowered, that doesn't mean I'm obligated in the same comment to think about what changes need to be made to it. Does it need to have reload adjusted, magazine adjusted, minimum, maximum damage, uh, drop off, a bullet speed, total this, that, and the other thing, iron sight variability, it's... Come on. This can be complex stuff. But it's easy to point out that there's a flaw in the game. If someone says this game is boring, they're not obligated to say, well, what things would make it exciting? Because really what you're asking people at that point is, oh, you have a problem with the game? Well, okay, now you make one. Go. And it should be kind of obvious when people say the RPG elements were dumbed down, there are literally things that were in New Vegas that do not exist at all in Fallout 4. Implying that it is unintelligent of people to say that the RPG elements of Fallout 4 were dumbed down without on the spot presenting ways to make it better and RPG elements in a game, again, that's game design, which game companies fuck up all the time. It's not simple. It's not easy. Well, to call those people unintelligent, that's asinine and it makes you look like an asshole. This is the exact sort of response that you deserved to receive for your In Defense of Fallout 4 video, just like Mr. Matty Plays, and for the exact same reasons. But instead of receiving the response from Rags or anyone else that you so richly deserved, instead, YouTube's reaction was... So, it's up to me to save the day. As for this unthinking toxicity that you speak of, would you care to show some proof of this? Cite some examples? If you're going to make these claims, then you need to back them up with proof. You know, it's funny, but all the unthinking toxicity that I see comes from the other side. From the pro- Bethesda side, and unlike Oxhorn, I will show some proof of this. Bullshits, you re a loser, go play games for kids. Games like Fallout 4 are not for kids like you. Go fuck yourself, noob. Fallout 4 is the best, and you're an idiot. Take a knife and jam it up your ass, Fallout 4 haters. Oh, this is total crap. You are one sour motherfucker. Were you fucking high or something? You sound like a 16-yo, retarded kid trying to look cool making this vid. Everything about Fallout 3 is great and you are retarded. You shouldn't be born. They should have stitched your mom pussy together while you were trying to get out. Useless, retarded shit kid. You're the stupidest person I've seen on YouTube, and it's not me fanboying the game. I don't care about your opinion. Hate the game as much as you want, but the story should make sense, dumbass. All haters can shut up. Fallout 3 may have flaws, but it's a truly good game at heart, 
and it's good to play it to know how far the company has come since the game. Fallout 4 is better, but at least they learn from their mistakes. If Fallout 3 wasn't made, who knows how bad Fallout 4 would be. These are just a few examples of what I would say is unthinking toxicity. The people who criticize Fallout 4 for not being an RPG are overwhelmingly, from what I've seen, intelligent and rational and, above all else, literate individuals in sharp contrast to the illiterate, hateful, infantile, bugthestards on the other side. And these comments are proof of this. If you've watched the video up until this point, I thank you. When I started making this video, I intended to reply to the entirety of Oxhorn's In Defense of Fallout 4 video. However, it quickly became apparent that this video was going to balloon into ridiculous proportions. I'm going to have to make a cut here because this video is nearly two hours long and it wouldn't be feasible to reply to the entirety of Oxhorn's video because at this rate it would end up being like 10 hours or 12 hour long video and I just can't deal with that. And I also doubt anyone would want to watch a video that would be that long. So I'm going to make a cut here, but... There is the chance that I might continue this in another video and possibly make this into a series if there is enough interest. If people want me to do it, I would consider doing that and reply to the entirety of his video over the course of, I don't know, multiple response videos because there's no way it could be done in just one at least not thoroughly and in-depth the way that I do, because I'm not Bethesda. So when I make a response video, you can be damn sure that my response video is not shallow as a mud puddle. And there was a lot of other bullshit that he said in his video that I didn't get to, like, for example, the things he said about Star Wars and Half-Life and so on. And I would love to get around to tearing all of those things apart. And if you want to see me do that, then let me know in the comments. Unlike Oxhorn, I do not beg people for money. I do not sell t-shirts. I do not receive ad revenue. I do not panhandle for Patreon donations. Because to me, this isn't about money. This is about a genuine love that I have for Fallout. And that is the reason why I make these videos, and especially this video in particular. Oxhorn titled his video, In Defense of Fallout 4. But perhaps a better way of titling it would be, In Defense of Anti-Consumer Corporate Greed, or In Defense of Casual Toddlerization and De-RPGification of the Fallout franchise because that is what he is defending. He is defending the removal of the RPG elements and the transformation of Fallout into a casual Minecraft building sim with guns. This is what defending Fallout 4 means. That means that you are defending these changes to the Fallout franchise. I, however, do not defend these changes, and because of that, I suppose that makes me toxic according to Oxhorn's retarded logic. But just let me say one final thing about this so-called toxicity, disrespect, etc. The real toxicity is what Bethesda has done and is continuing to do to the Fallout franchise. That is the toxicity. Bethesda is being disrespectful to the Fallout franchise and Bethesda is being disrespectful to their consumers with season passes, paid mods, creation club, etc. Bethesda is disrespectful to Tim Kaine and his vision for what Fallout was supposed to be. Shills like Oxhorn and anyone like him are being toxic 
and disrespectful just as much as Bethesda because they are defending what Bethesda does. And they do this in a manner that is unthinking and unintelligent. Anyway, I suspect the butthurt from Oxhorn and his supporters is going to be off the charts. And they will probably try to have this video taken down. And YouTube, being the ever-increasingly unfree and pro-censorship platform that it is becoming, they may oblige and take this video down. So to those of you who are still watching and have been with me from the beginning, I say download this video if you can and redistribute it anywhere and everywhere that you can so that it cannot be shut down. Oxhorn does not believe in freedom of speech. The fact that he bans people from his channel is proof of this. So if he is able to shut this video down, he will do so. Fair use be damned. But we won't go quietly. The Bugthestards can count on that.